<laughs> hello, everyone, and hello, Martin. Hi, Deirdre, and welcome, everyone, to uh, today's Office Hours, the first one of 2024. Yes, that's right, and it's going to be a good one. <laughs> I have I'm been excited. waiting anxiously for this show for so many reasons. <laughs> yeah, well, it should be really a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to it as well because there's so much to talk about when it comes to AI. So we'll have our guest, Megan, come on in a couple of minutes. But before we do, we've got a really great lineup of guests coming out for the rest of, uh, well, this season, let's say, <laughs> the winter and spring. Our next one coming up in March is Brooke Sellis, who's been on before, and she's going to be talking about customer service and social media and how to really use social media well to show your customers how much you care and that you're listening to them. So that'll be a great conversation as well. Yes. And today's conversation is all about how to raise your creative bar. And I don't know, when I think about creativity, I think about passion, purpose, process and play. And I have a feeling that Megan is going to dive into all of those areas. So what do you say, Martin? Should we introduce Megan and bring her in? Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, first off, if any of you don't realize it, Megan Breckenridge has my last name because it is my daughter. <laughs> so I'm really excited. This is a first for us. Megan and I have had many firsts but this is the first time that I'm interviewing her with Martin. And for those of you who don't know Megan, she is a digital marketer, a designer, and an entrepreneur. She founded her company, Mind Chromatic Media, in 2021. And since then, she's been working with her clients on creative strategy and different digital marketing programs. Her clients include anyone from executive coaches and communications agencies to brands that are in the health and wellness space and financial services. And if you want to learn more about Megan, you can go to her website, meganbreckenridge.com, or I encourage you to connect with her on LinkedIn. So let's get Megan. You forgot one brand. Oh, and that my. is the DM yes. brand because Megan created the branding for our show as well. And so everything you see here, all of the way we show up in uh, social and digital media. Thank you, <laughs> Megan, for that as well. Now you can bring Megan. Yes. On. Thank you, Megan. And here she is. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Thank you Good for morning. having me and for that warm intro introduction. Well, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you are welcome. So we want to dive right in because there's a lot to cover. And let's encourage everybody to ask their questions, put them in the, the chat, because Megan is happy to answer them. But yeah, Martin, and yeah, I'm going to kick it off. And for everyone who's out there, any questions, just let us know. We will do our best to answer them. The other thing is um, to let us know where you're from. I see Ken Jacobs is here. Hello, yes. Ken. Uh, Shofa Garman is here. Great. Welcome. And uh, welcome, everyone. So the first question that I want to ask is, um, I mean, you're, in addition to being really creative, you're also an entrepreneur. And most people, you know, when you're starting your career and you're a little bit earlier on in your career than, say, uh, your mom, Deirdre, and I are, <laughs> you know, people often choose to go with a job, but you chose to be an entrepreneur. Um, why did you do that? And um, what made you focus on digital media and uh, entrepreneurship? Well, I've always had more interests than I've known what to do with. So when the time came for me to start thinking about my career, that turned into a desire to wear many hats. And I found that digital media, digital marketing really lends itself to that. But what really made me take the leap into entrepreneurship is that accountability, ownership, flexibility that I have with my work, because that has allowed me to push my creative boundaries further and further. And even thinking about it now, 
that's still what I love most about being an entrepreneur. Well, I do too. So I can relate to that, Megan. And I want to give a shout out to, uh, I see Stephanie Beaver. Stephanie's a cousin. <laughs> so we've got family on. And I see Raymond from River Edge. Hey, Ray, thanks so much for joining. And Jennifer from South Chicago is here as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, Megan. We covered the entrepreneur and the digital media focus. There's a lot of skills and traits that need to be honed when you're on this journey. What do you think are those top skills or traits that have really led to your creative confidence? That's a really good question. And I do want to go a bit deeper than just saying refining my video editing or improving my web design, both of which are true, but on a more foundational level, I would say adaptability and self-discipline. First, I learned very quickly that I needed to roll with the punches, especially in digital marketing. It could be a breaking news story that conflicts with a campaign, a social media platform being down for the day, a last minute client request that shakes things up a bit. But in any event, I found that being open to things not going to plan gave me the confidence to quickly and creatively problem solve so that we could move forward in the best way possible. And then second, self-discipline, I think, is the key to excellent client service because that's your ability to meet deadlines, be efficient with budget, have a consistent attention to detail. So I try to establish that very early on in my working relationships because when I do that, something really cool happens. <laughs> they start to trust me. And the sooner trust is established, the sooner we can really get those ideas rolling. So self-discipline leads to excellent service. Excellent service leads to trust. And trust is really what gives me the collaborative and creative freedom I need to truly bring someone's vision to life. And just the, on the note of self-discipline, because I, I do think that's important as a creative, as an entrepreneur, but what happens if the client doesn't meet your self-discipline? How, how does that work out? <laughs> I'm all about meeting my clients where they are. And I take it upon myself to be the one with the structure, the organization, have all my ducks in the row so I can say to my clients, hey, it's ready when you're ready, but also no pressure. I know that there are other things that are going on, irons in the fire, but just know that you can have the peace and confidence that it's here waiting for you when you're ready. Hmm. Okay, um, I have a question, but I just want to say uh, to everyone who is here and listening, please uh, pop your questions into the comments. If you have any, if you have any comments, let us know. We have people here from Paris, former student Veronica is here. So hello, Veronica. Um, Saudi Arabia is here. So really from all over the place. Anyway, please pop your questions in. I've got a one though, and that is about your creative process, especially when you're working with clients who have one vision and you have mm -hmm. another vision. So one, how, what is your creative process and um, how do you find the time to create when you're managing clients who can be sometimes very demanding? <laughs> yeah. So with aligning visions with clients, number one, I take my ego out of it. I'm here to serve my clients and as I mentioned, bring their vision to life. So that's the first thing with any collaboration that I do. And then in terms of process, I would say that it's really centered around pacing myself because that's not necessarily something that comes naturally to me. 
I tend to think pretty black and white in that I want to finish a project in one sitting or not start it at all. And the problem with that is I rarely have time in my day to block off enough to finish greater tasks in full. And in the past, that led to a lot of procrastination and a lot of cramming, which is unsustainable. And I was also robbing myself of that opportunity to come back to my work with fresh eyes before sharing it. So now what I do is I break projects down, tasks down as much as possible. And I physically write this down so I can visualize and pinpoint natural start and end points within a greater task because then I'm better able to puzzle piece my day and also produce better work. And I do also want to make a note on finding time because with personal creative projects, that's a bit different than a paid creative project and finding time for that. So with personal creative projects, I want to share a quote. What is urgent is seldom important and what is important is seldom urgent. So when I'm trying to find time for a project that is personal and important to me, I set aside that time as much as I can. And that's also become easier with my current process. Oh, that's good. Um, we actually have a question uh, from Jumana, which is, what do you think the connection is between an immersive events planning company and a creative company? So I don't have a whole lot of experience with immersive events planning in particular, but I would say with anything, it's the client service and also understanding the audience and making sure that whatever materials you create and direction that you take, it's serving the client and serving the target audience in a way that's meaningful and resonates with them. And I think that's just true across any service yeah. company. Yeah. And I think we're all creative or we all can be creative if we let ourselves be creative. You don't have to, I started out as an advertising copywriter. And honestly, the creatives had a uniform that they wore, which was different than the suits. I don't think <laughs> that differentiates people anymore or oh, should yeah. have even then. I, I totally agree. I, I mean, I think you can tell so far with my answers, I am a deeply creative person, but I also have a logical side to me. I'm, I am quite practical in terms of my process and how I go about things. And that combination is, it works for me. And I, I think if people can take down those silos between all the different logical, creative, what have you, that's where true connection and creativity comes into play. Give and there's another, another question. Oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah, from uh, Raymond, were you going to say? Yes, our, our friend Ray, he wanted to know, how do you get past the fear of starting your own company and vision? So you just have to go for it. I thought enough about it for it to work out, but I didn't think too hard to get in my own brain that, oh, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, because once I started it, it's hard. It, it's not an easy thing at all, but it's so worth it. And I think that's also what, when you have that entrepreneur gene inside of you, <laughs> what, you're get that you call it, it's it doesn't go away. It and you have to honor that. So if you are itching to start your own company, keep that with you and, and make it happen because it is deeply fulfilling when it does. I, I also think that there's something about when you have that really strong idea and passion and, and being an entrepreneur, you, you have that drive and passion. The less you tell people as you're thinking about it, the better off you are. It's almost don't let the half-baked idea out too soon because 
you might hear things that make you nervous and more fearful. I remember announcing to my family, I'm an entrepreneur <laughs> and I have a company. And if I had done that a little too early, then maybe it might not have happened. So I'm very lucky because I have a family with entrepreneurs and, and that obviously has been a great influence on me and so I'm, I'm lucky. I'm grateful. That's good. You trusted uh, your can, intuition. Can I uh, give a teeny plug for a LinkedIn learning course of mine, which yeah, sure. is all about how to become a marketing entrepreneur. And so it's a Ooh. short course, but there's some interesting templates in it. I talk about cash flow. I talk about business plan. So I'm going to just share it in the chat and uh, then you know, whoever wants to, it's a free link there in the chat. If you want to go there, you can go there. And that's just what it looks like, but I'm going to hide it. Awesome. Well, I know your course is Mark Martin. And I think everybody who's interested in becoming an entrepreneur or who is and wants to grow should take a look at your course. So Megan, part of being an entrepreneur is a lot of intuition, but that also goes to the creative process. So can you share a little bit about how intuition guides your creative process? Well, for me, it's kind of everything. It's my ability to tune in externally and internally so that I can create work that doesn't just look good. It's authentic to the person or brand that it's tied to. That's what's going to resonate with their target audience, any design or piece of content, because aesthetics are repeatable, but authenticity, I think, is bespoke. And I think that's really where my intuition has played a critical role. I like that. Authenticity is bespoke. Hashtag authenticity <laughs> is bespoke, right? That's yeah. a good one. That's a good sound bite right there. Well, that leads into our next question. It's uh, interesting because my next question is the exact same question that uh, one of our listeners has, Hope uh, Prost. Hopefully I'm pronouncing this right. And that is, how are you planning your creative with the in introduction of AI products? In other words... How the heck does generative AI fit in with your creative process, with creativity and with authenticity? Yeah, so it seems like the role of AI in creative is only just unfolding. But for now, I first want to share what I don't think it is. I don't think that it's best suited as a creative substitute for something or someone. Rather, it's a very interesting tool for creatives to leverage to broaden their horizons, be more efficient, and gain new perspectives that they can implement into their own work. And so what I did, and if anyone else is feeling uncertain about AI at first, I would say try to shift that into curiosity. Try the tools out for yourself. Find answers to the questions that you have. Subscribe to Martin's newsletter for the latest and greatest on AI and digital marketing. Just take in as much as you can so that you can determine how to effectively incorporate it into your creative strategy and stay on the cutting edge. Yeah, that's good. Um, we have another co uh, question and that is from Himanshi. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do to overcome creative block, which is something that anyone, everyone who's creative is uh, faces at some point that you know, fear or panic at staring at the blank screen. Mm -hmm. And I will admit, I had probably a, a three year long creative block and, and it was really hard. And so to overcome that, I have three words, intentional space practice. 
And that's really what it sounds like. It's giving yourself time and space from what you're working on, but to break it down, the intentionality of it, setting aside time, making an appointment with myself so I don't just glaze over it. And the space itself should be a relatively analog activity. A quintessential example is meditation. I personally love weightlifting, but any form of movement, it could be cooking, knitting, journaling, reading. The point is to bring your focus home to the present moment. And that's really what you're looking for. And the practice is incorporating it into your daily routine, flexing the muscle of a quiet mind. Don't underestimate the power of that because that's what brings clarity and will reduce the frequency of creative blocks in general. And that has it's kind of changed my life. So that's, that's what I do. And I would recommend it to anyone. I think the practice part is really making it as you said, the muscle memory, it becomes a good habit. Yeah, it, it's transcended just my creativity. It's made me a happier, healthier person, I would say. Well, you That's know, it, yeah, and it, it's really interesting because I read an article recently talking about how writers, artists, filmmakers, musicians um, have creative blocks. But mm -hmm. if you're a taxi driver, you don't have a taxi driving block. If you're, <laughs> if you work in a store, you don't have a retail, either store owner block. Mm -hmm. And so part of what you were saying about intentionality, I think is really important to know that sometimes the idea isn't there or doesn't come as easily. And sometimes you have to work for the idea. Um, yeah. Do you have any tips on like how you can if you feel stuck aside from you know intentionality and practicing what else do you think people can do or what else do you do to come up with a fresh idea or if a client says oh yeah that's good but no i want you to start again yeah so it, it that is the tricky bit that's where it's hard when you come to a client and they're just like no, this is this isn't it. So I'll say with a paid project with a client, that's when you really need to embrace feedback because you could be the most creative person in the world, but you're not a mind reader. Get into what they're thinking and feeling so you can understand better. That understanding will make a big difference in the next iteration of what you create. And it may not be quite what you were thinking but again leaving your ego at the door and really just serving your client yeah yes. that's hard though i know your it's ego hard, at the door but... sometimes really yeah it's hard it's hard to to learn but it's helped me a lot i i have strong opinions on design and as any creative would but it's it just it creates that more collaborative environment when you are open and open to feedback. And I, I try to establish that early on with my clients too. say, hey, I love feedback. I want to know what you're thinking. And it, it has helped the process for me a lot. I actually, I mean, mom, you can kind of attest to it. I, I get things on the first try <laughs> too often. It's, yes, it's working with hard. Megan, she does get it on the first try, no doubt. But I do think there's something important to unpack with what you're saying. If you are listening and you can give the client what they want and you're moving them in a certain direction, you're building trust. Because if you're new uh, or, or even you're working at a company and you're into the creative part of it, you might not get that design that's out of the box, but a trust builds so that you can move towards something that is in a direction that is good for the client and serves the creative purpose. And you, you grow together. Yeah. And also another thing I do is I actively look for things that inspire me, even if it's not necessarily part of what I'm working on, but just 
anything that I find inspirational. And I love YouTube and I love YouTube videos. I um, I appreciate how much effort goes into a YouTube video versus sometimes just a 10 second TikTok. And so <laughs> I I look at YouTube. I look at YouTube creators when I really want to feel inspired because I'm just like, oh, I could do that. And, and it, it just kind of revs me up and, and feels good. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's well, a great piece of advice, actually, to look at what other creators do rather oh, than yeah. feel it, especially if you're stuck for an idea. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it's YouTube videos, whatever works for you, because you can find creativity in so much. You can find creativity in, you know, books, art books, go to a museum mm -hmm. or a gallery. I try to, if, if I'm stuck, I go for a walk. And I always find if I go for a walk after the first 20 minutes where I'm still swirling in my head, once I let go of that, I can usually at least open the door to the possibility of finding another answer, another idea. Yeah. One thing I do. So I say that when I weight lift, that's like shaking the dust off of my brain, the shelves of my brain. And so after I weight lift, I come home, I immediately journal. So it's that combination of shaking the dust off and then processing it in writing. That's, that's a good one. That's good. <laughs> I meditate. I breathe a lot. And when I breathe and I pair my awareness with my concentration, I can focus and then ideas come. So that helps get over some of those creative blocks. I think we have time for one more question. It's gone by fast. I'm ready. Uh, okay. Deirdre, do you yeah. want to do that? Sure, absolutely. You know, I think at this point, Megan, you've shared a ton, maybe just some parting advice for all the creatives out there who, who want to raise their bar. So this is specific to social media but I would say check in with how much you're consuming versus creating. If you're finding that you are scrolling far more than you're contributing meaningfully to a conversation, I think that's your invitation to close out the app and either do your intentional space practice or just start creating something that matters to you. It's gonna feel a lot more fulfilling. Definitely. And Megan, isn't there an app that uh, oh, tells yeah. you how much time you spend on social media? Maybe share that with everybody so they can start cutting back if they need to. I I use the app Opal. I will admit I don't have the willpower to stop scrolling sometimes. So I use <laughs> Opal and it has helped a lot because there is a deep focus sec session that once you're in it, you can't edit it. You can't close it. So if I become brazen, I'm like, I don't want to be on Instagram or TikTok for a whole day. I do deep focus and I have to commit to that. And it it helps a lot. So <laughs> don't you even get badges for the time? Oh, yeah, I get <laughs> badges, which is right up my alley. So I, I really like that app. Excellent. Well, that's very good and then good advice. Martin, anything else? Yeah, just for anyone who wants to connect with you, Megan, how can they find you on uh, social media or your website? So find me on LinkedIn. I'm Megan Breckenridge. On Instagram, I'm Megan Breckenridge. I just made a new Instagram because I am pivoting creatively on social media. So fair warning, the following still quite low at this stage. And on TikTok, same thing, but it's Megan dot Breckenridge. Okay, that's great. And anyone, you know, who has a creative challenge, I'd encourage you to connect with Megan to oh, find out about it. And, you know, um, just because for our show, when we were coming up with, you know, the idea for this, we really didn't have any creative vision for it. Megan, you really helped sort of yes. establish that. So thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your insights today. Oh, thank yes. you so much for having me. Thank you, Megan. And thank you to everybody for tuning in for another episode of the DM show. And we will be back again in March. So thank yeah. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.